What is up everybody, Dak here, and today I'm going to be talking about speakers, their parts, the names of the parts and materials, and how they work. So first off, I'm going to be using a kind of cross-sectional view of this driver right here, like an x-ray view, in order to uh, show off different components, highlight them, name them, and talk a bit about how they work. So first off, I'm going to be looking at these highlighted parts right here. Now these are called the soft parts. Why are they called the soft parts? Because they move and they're not as durable. These parts right here are the most common parts to break in a speaker and in a lot of cases they're replaceable. So first off I'm going to be looking at the cone. Now the cone is called the cone because it's most commonly shaped like a cone although it can be flat and it can be bowl shaped but usually it's shaped like a cone because it's got a very strong characteristic to it where this shape right here can handle a lot of weight compared to say a flat bit of material and speaking of materials, it's most commonly made out of things like paper and plastic, although in certain cases you can find cones made out of aluminium, uh, carbon fibre and Kevlar. And the next one is the dust cap. Now this was called the dust cap as its main purpose was to kind of stop dirt and grime getting in here, but in modern drivers it's also responsible for some strength in the driver. This can help brace the driver and also for its kind of pumping effect that used to cool down components that I'll talk about a bit later. Now dust caps are usually made out of similar materials to the cone such as if it's carbon fiber cone, carbon fiber dust cap but they'll also often be made out of plastic. And next is the surround. Uh, the surround keeps the driver moving in and out nicely and also it forms a bit of a seal between the outside environment and the inside of the box so it can have a much easier time producing low frequencies. If the surround was rotting on a driver and it didn't exist anymore, uh, that driver would have an extremely hard time creating bass at all. It also is responsible partially for the springiness and the damping of a driver, but that's mainly down to the next component, which is the spider. And also, just quickly, uh, surrounds are most commonly made out of things like uh, rubber, uh, multi-roll fabric surrounds which are the ones that kind of zigzag and also foam special types of foam which aren't as brittle as maybe packing foam that you might think of so the spider uh, there are generally two types of spiders there's linear and progressive linear spiders are most commonly used in sql kind of speakers sound quality speakers and progressive spiders are used in SPL applications, sound pressure, where you're trying to get as loud as possible and are pushing as much power into the speaker as possible. Uh, they can also be in packs when you've got about five spiders all tightly layered next to each other. And you can also have two sets of spiders or just two spiders in the same speaker. But the most common configuration you'll see is a single spider just like this here. And the spider is responsible for a lot of the springiness of a speaker when you push it and it springs back out. And also a lot of the damping in a speaker. Like a, like when you hold a ruler or a spring and you're twang it, it, the damping is what makes it gradually stop. And in speakers it's really crucial when the signal stops being sent to the driver that it stops making sound, it doesn't ring, it doesn't go, mm. you want it to stop immediately. The next one is the tinsel leads. Uh, these are what gets electricity from the terminals here, which I'll talk about later, into the voice call here, which I'll also talk about later. The tinsel leads are called the tinsel leads because if you've ever had a look at them, they're kind of light and spaced out. They're very kind of airy wires, and they do kind of resemble tinsel. Uh, they do that because properties like these give them a very high tolerance to being flexed over and over again. These ones are very durable. Although sometimes in high powered drivers you can see copper, high strand count copper conductors, but in most drivers, including lots of very high powered drivers, it will be kind of tensely looking and sometimes too you'll see it as part of the spider running into the middle. Uh, this part right here is called the triple joint. It's where the cone, the next part, which is the voice call former, and the spider all come together. Often the cone joins right where the spider joins onto the voice coil former, and this right here will often get a big dose of epoxy 
and stuff like that in order to make this area very strong. This can sometimes break in high SPL applications right here. And yeah, on to the next part, the voice score former. Uh, commonly made of composites or aluminium and this part right here is responsible for transferring the force from the voice coil to the cone. It's also responsible for keeping the voice coil in one piece which is wrapped around it. Now there are two types of voice coils. There are copper coated aluminium which are common in SPL subwoofers and there are just raw copper, oxygen free copper voice coils which are popular in sound quality drivers. Now aluminium's lighter gives drivers a lower moving mass and generally makes them more efficient. Uh, it's also got a higher heat capacity, it can absorb more heat before it starts to heat up, which is one of the reasons why it's popular in SPL subwoofers. Yeah, that's right, aluminium, which is the lighter material, can store more heat than copper. Kind of counterintuitive, but yeah. Uh, these are also two types, there's round wire, which is where just stand wire, and also flat wire voice coils, which are kind of rectangular shaped wire. And if you've got a flat wire voice coil, you can usually wrap it a lot tighter and you can fit a lot more windings into the same amount of space. Uh, next thing on the menu is away from the soft parts uh, onto these other parts here. Uh, now this is the basket, also known as the frame. It's kind of shaped like a basket, but people also sometimes call it the frame, so I've included both names. Uh, there are two main basket types. There's stamped steel, which is when you get a flat bit of steel and you squish it into this kind of cone shape here. And there is also cast aluminium baskets. Now cast aluminium baskets are becoming more popular especially as driver power increases and also magnet weight increases. Those are the two main types. Uh, next thing here is, now this wasn't actually included in the other ones, it's one of those less common things, but this is called the mounting gasket. If you see a bit of rubber which goes around the rim of a driver right next to the surround, this is called a mounting gasket. Our next thing here is where the spider connects to the frame it is called the spider landing and once again some baskets have multiple spider landings depending on what kind of soft parts can be put into them and sometimes both spider landings are used and these right here these are called the terminals uh, there are three main types there's spade connectors which most kind of average slash even hi-fi speakers have there's spring terminals or push terminals like these ones here and there is also bolt terminals. Now there's another one which isn't technically a terminal, it's called direct leads, and it's when the sub or the driver manufacturer just runs leads straight out of the speaker and skips the terminals. So the direct leads connect straight up to the tinsel leads. And the next part of parts I'm gonna be talking about are these right here. Now this is called the motor. Uh, the motor is responsible for taking power that is sent into the speaker through the terminals, through the tinsel leads and into the voice coil and turning it into sound. So what are parts of the motor? First off we've got the obvious ones, the magnets. These two things right here are the magnets. They're usually in this in this situation right here, I'll talk about neodymium magnets later, but in this case right here these are ferrite magnets, ferrite permanent magnets. This piece right here which kind of goes above the magnets in between the basket and the magnet is called the top plate. This thing right here is called the back plate. Sometimes it's a single piece that goes all the way across. And the back plate connects to this part right here, which goes up the middle of the voice coil, called the pole piece. Now this assembly, in total, is sometimes called the T yoke, as it's kind of, if I flip it upside down, it's kind of shaped like a T. But often it can be two different parts, which is the back plate and the pole piece. Next part is the coil gap. Now this isn't really a part, but it's a f more of a feature. So it's this gap right here, which is where the coil goes in between these two bits of metal right here and here. Now you possibly wondered, why isn't the voice coil closer to the magnet? Wouldn't it get a stronger magnetic force if it was down here? And the reason why is because magnets kind of, if you've ever seen field lines of a magnet displayed, then you know it kind of goes from north all the way around to south. Now if you've got a bit of steel, what happens is it gets channeled through the steel and it kind of comes around and although this is a bigger field, it's not stronger. It is actually a bit weaker, 
but you can channel the magnetic field through materials. So if you've got something like this right here, you can see that instead of doing big loops, because it wants to get to south as quickly as possible, it'll come up, go through the metal, go down, and then it'll go back in, and it'll really tie up the magnetic field. And in a case like this, if there's only one way that it can loop around, then all of the magnet strength will be put through this gap right here. And this is where the voice coil goes. So you can get an incredibly strong magnetic field right where the voice coil goes. Now, another thing I should mention is voice coils work by magnetic field lines going through it. So if the voice coil were right next to the magnet, you can see that no field lines go through it. So it'd have virtually no strength at all. But in this case right here, it'd have a ton of strength, giving it really good efficiency. And the next part is in between the pole piece, which is the pole vent. Now, as I mentioned before, the dust cap kind of pumps air through this gap and it aids with cooling the voice coil. Modern drivers, high power voice coils need more cooling. Voice coils can only get so hot. So a 5,000 watt voice coil, chances are it's less than 50 degrees hotter than say a 50 watt voice coil. It's pretty crazy. It's all down to cooling. And one of the big features of cooling is this right here, which is the pole vent. Now the pole vent also stops pressure being built up in certain subs. And in some cases, I've seen dust caps blown off the front of speakers due to the pressure being created by this area right here being closed off and air being squished under here. And right here, this feature here where you can kind of see that there's this bump is called the backplate bump. Uh, this is to get just a bit more excursion capabilities out of the voice call so it can move a bit further before hitting the back plate. Another feature that you'll see to improve power handling in modern drivers is uh, coil gap venting. Now this is in the bottom of the motor and it's where you drill several holes that go through into essentially this area where the voice coil is. So you can see here's a bottom view, it's not very good, but you kind of get the idea. There's the pole vent right there. This is all the back plate. And you can see all these holes which are drilled in and sometimes too, if you're careful, you can actually make out the voice coil in this gap here. Pretty well all subs which have a power handling of 5,000 watts these days have something similar to this. Now, another type of motor you'll see is the neodymium motor. So this right here is because neodymium magnets are so strong, they don't really need help channeling their flux just like the other ferrite permanent magnets did. So this is north right here. Instead of it being top and bottom with the other ones, uh, this is north right here and it's side to side. All the flux comes across here, travels down through the material and back into the back of the magnet. So this right here is an insanely strong motor. And this is most commonly used in SPL applications. Uh, this type of driver is where it's used the neodymium in order to make a really small motor. In fact, it's so small, they've actually put it on the inside of the voice coil rather than the outside. Uh, now, this is used more like the other ferrite motors with the north at the top and the south at the bottom. And you can see that it channels the flux up through here down here and back around. So this is kind of like the top plate here and then this is still like the back plate and things like that. And you can see this motor right here is way smaller than this motor right here and is likely about the same strength. So these are very good for making drivers really compact and lightweight. Now another thing to note about these type of neodymium magnets is usually these are a bunch of rectangular magnets which are segmented around and the gaps in between the neodymium magnets can help cool down or help aid cool the voice coil which is why these type of motors most commonly have the highest power rating. Now another feature which I haven't mentioned yet but is becoming more and more common in speakers is this right here which is called the shorting ring. Now this is just a ring of aluminium or copper in the motor and what it's supposed to do is when the voice coil produces a changing magnetic field sometimes it can mess with this magnet right here and cause a bit of distortion. So what these things right here is they receive current induced into them by the voice coil and it opposes the voice coil's magnetic field 
and what it does is it kind of calms down the system and it's good for SQL drivers and making drivers sound a bit cleaner. Another alternative to the backplate bump is putting another magnet in. Now this also does make the motor a bit stronger and the driver a bit more efficient. So instead of having a single magnet with a bump in high excursion drivers, usually they'll have double stacked magnets or even triple or quadruple. I think quadruple is the most I've seen in drivers which have legitimately 10 centimeters or four inches of excursion. Uh, the next thing is this isn't so common in drivers. Uh, this is called an underhung motor. All these other designs have been overhung motors where the voice coil is longer than the gap. But in underhung motors, the voice coil is actually shorter than the gap. So this one here, its maximum excursion is from where the top of the voice coil gets to the top of the gap or the bottom gets to the bottom of the gap. Now, excursion here is when the bottom of the coil gets to the top of the gap or the top of the coil gets to the bottom of the gap. So you can see that this one right here has just a small bit more excursion than this system right here. Now these aren't so popular because when you're channeling magnetic flux, uh, a lot of it doesn't go through the voice coil and that doesn't make it very efficient. But in these situations here, all the magnetic flux goes through the voice coil. These might become more popular with neodymium magnets, but I wouldn't expect it either because the voice coil always has to be smaller than the magnetic field gap, and the bigger the voice coil, the more power it can handle. Now, some more things you'd see on the cone, uh, right here, the wizard cone. Uh, these are put on some full range speakers around kind of the dust cap area, and what they do is they try to boost high frequencies and boost the high frequency efficiency of these drivers. Now these are common in like 6.5 inch full range drivers or 5 inch full range drivers, 4 inch, even something like a 5x7 that I've got in my car have these wizard cones. Now they're not actually that good, you're better off using something such as a coaxial tweeter but I'll go through that in a second. Another thing that you'll see in some drivers is the phase plug. Now this is just kind of a bullet shaped thing which goes onto the pole piece of the motor and I'm not sure exactly their purpose. Some people say that they help with phase alignment and things like that, which they very possibly could in sound quality speakers, but I'm not sold yet that they're always better than just using a dust cap. Some companies also say that they help with cooling the voice coil, so that's another possibility. And yeah, the coaxial tweeter. These are way better than wizard cones, always, even if they're crappy tweeters. Wizard cones just can't go higher than 12 kilohertz. I think it's about the highest I've seen one of those go. And the coaxial tweeter is usually in a plastic kind of thing, and it mounts onto the pole piece right here, and is often screwed in from the back, and it's usually got some sticker over the back here, just so you can't see this kind of well with the screw in it. Uh, you'll also see that this has a capacitor. Now the capacitor acts like the most basic crossover. Uh, it mainly protects the tweeter from low frequencies then forming an actual crossover frequency. The driver itself doesn't have any sort of crossover. The only crossover it has is its natural inductance, which I'll go through in the next video where I talk about speaker parameters. Now the final thing that I'm going to be talking about is ferrofluid. Uh, these aren't popular in subwoofers like this at all. You'll never see them in a sub, even a mid-range. You'll only really see them in tweeters. And that's for two main reasons. One, because if the driver moves a lot, this material is just going to get everywhere. It's going to be gross. And two, tweeters get very hot. Imagine a 100 watt tweeter and a 100 watt mid-range. The 100 watt tweeter has this tiny one inch voice coil, about five mils tall, and the 100 watt mid-range might have a 1.5 inch or a 2 inch voice coil. It's got a much bigger voice coil and it's able to naturally radiate heat a lot more by pumping air as the speaker moves. So ferrofluid is often used in tweeters as to cool them. So it's put in this magnetic gap right here and it transfers heat from the voice coil into the magnet to help cool it down. So yeah, those are all the materials and parts names of speakers. If you've got any questions, leave a comment below. Uh, after this, I'll be doing kind of the more intermediate or advanced kind of properties of speakers. 
So yeah, thanks for watching. And if you're interested to learn more about speakers or you didn't understand something in this video, feel free to leave a comment. I'll answer it. And yeah, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you're interested and I'll see you later.